colors that are sort of hallucinatory, uh, the visionary quality of the picture. Uh, and I should say, by the way, he didn't have anything wrong with his eyes. That's one of the big theories, is that, you know, if he painted like this, because that's how he saw it, or he all stretched out like this. As we'll see, that comes out of what he learned in Venice, the manner of style there. Um, and again, he can do perfectly normal proportions when he feels like it. Also, I have to just mention that he was pretty much forgotten about it for 250 or so years. He was just too strange for a conservative uh, taste. And then we discovered, well, off and on, but mostly in the 1960s and 70s, when people who were, well, just, you know, again, having hallucinations, they found in him a kind of kindred spirit. It was something that, you know, there was something about his eye. His eye, man. This sort of thing. But, you know, again, well, maybe he was, who knows. Anyway, that's when it became really popular. Uh, all of this stuff that what we expect of Greco's works to look like, it's very hard, I think, to, to show that also by him. And this is, I don't know if there's another artist I can think of that really changes so radically uh, from style to style. Uh, so that's what we have to do to get back to the very uh, beginning. And one of the good things, Al Greco, it's actually a mix of both Spanish and Italian, which is a good thing, because that's sort of what he, what he learned. Uh, it should be either Il Greco or El Grigo. Um, I don't think, I'm, I was wondering if he'd be quite so famous today if, he, if we still had to call him Domenicos the Otokopoulos. I feel a bit sorry for him. People are asking for his autograph. And he's, you know, <laughs> but all these Greek actors, very difficult for them. Anyway, here he, here he is. Uh, map of Crete that you all know well. Um, because he's from here, born in or near, well, Candia then, Heraklion, uh, now born in 1541. And that, just to put that in context, that's exactly the time that Michelangelo is finishing the Last Judgment in the Sistine uh, Chapel. And I should also tell you that but then, because it's a sort of new spirit of Pur Puritanism that El Greco catches up with. Uh, when he was living in Rome, he actually offered the Pope, uh, Paul the Pius V, to repaint basically the last, uh, the last judgment and clean it up a bit. And well, the, the, because there are certain areas that were uh, rather offensive, so there were little bits of drapery that miraculously appeared later on, and some people didn't get that much. Uh, but and it was a fellow called Daniele da Volterra who was actually commissioned to put on these little bits of drapery. And he's known to history as Daniele della Pantalone, uh, Daniel of the Trousers. Uh, anyway, we have to also remember that Crete at this time was part of the Venetian uh, Republic. So it's very natural for a, an ambitious young artist to want to go to Venice to continue their career there. Quite a few of them did, but of course, none of them were as successful as uh, El Greco. But if he hadn't done that, he would just stayed being a fairly normal, ordinary, competent icon painter. Because it was, it was, it was a bit of a bit smothering, really. You weren't really out to change. Nobody cared what you thought, because you were a painter, a sort of humble craftsman. You weren't allowed to express your own ideas, uh, particularly in uh, religious art. So he gets out of uh, Crete, uh, eventually. We don't really know anything about his early life there. He came from a fairly wealthy family. So presumably he's quite well educated. When he was 22, he's listed as a, ma a master in the Guild of Painters in Candia. So he would have had to be independent. He would have had his own studio uh, by that point. So I'm just going to show you a few things that he did or might have done in the few years, either in Crete or just after he's gone over to Italy. And the first of is this one, the Dormition of the Virgin. Um, it's quite so. It's only, again, everything appears the same size on the screen. It's only about two feet high, this high. Uh, it's in the cathedral of the Dormition on the island of Syros, probably taken there from Crete during the Greek War of Independence. The Dor Dor Dormition of the Virgin, just literally means the falling asleep. This is the Virgin Mary sort of dying, uh, leaving her earthly body, and then is resurrected up in uh, heaven. And I mean, again, you wouldn't recognize this as a you know, Greco, but in 1983, somebody clever discovered the signature. And I don't know how clear that is, if you can see that. This is a shot that I took. Uh, I think you can see it fairly clearly, mm -hmm. Domain across the, the Otokopoulos. Uh, and that was a very helpful for establishing, you know, just comparing other works that might be, could be 
wanted to be by uh, El Greco. He did actually sign his name, Theotokopoulos, for his entire career, even when he was over in uh, Spain. So this looks very Byzantine to me, the whole tradition of Byzantine. It's tempera, it's gold on panel, which is the traditional techniques. Uh, Such with the style, makes it look like centuries of icons. I even found another couple that were sort of similar-ish, the iconography, somebody called uh, Andreas Ritsos did that about 80 years earlier, about a Russian icon. I mean, they're different, a little bit different, but not a whole lot, because the whole, uh, again, you couldn't change. You couldn't, that meant you were changing the story, and that wouldn't do. So we were on Syros, a couple of years ago, we were on a cruise, and stopped off there, and I remember the guy kept going on and on and on, how, you know, wait for it, wait for it, we're going to see this wonderful, the greatest treasure on the island is this painting by the wonderful El Greco, and finally we get there, and of course everybody, they were expecting an El Greco, so everybody just walked right past it. It's in the narthex, the little kind of, you know, that's to do before you get into the church itself, and it's tiny as you can see, that's a good one for scale. By this point the guy had left, you know, his day was done, so I had to stand behind this sort of ushering people, I was thinking, oh, this is it, this is it, and huh? Because you know, even this chap here, he's not looking, looking a little bit dubious about the whole thing. So that's one of the key works for establishing the early style. It's a, it is a real, um, the attribution has to be right. Now this one, now this is in the Banaki Museum in, in Athens, the St. Luke painting the Virgin. Again, very small, only about 16 inches high. Uh, same thing, tempera gold. Uh, actually, this is on canvas, but then it's glued down onto a panel. And again, it's signed somewhere, I've never actually been able to find it, but somewhere under the stool there, this very wonky perspective of the easel. But you probably know St. Luke was the, among other things, was a painter, and he apparently uh, created a portrait from the life of Mary and the little baby Jesus. And there's lots of contenders which the real one is. I think the Church of Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome, they claim to have the actual one, uh, but it isn't. Uh, several hundred years too late. But anyway, that qualifies St. Luke to be the patron saint of uh, painters. And again, people get quite excited about this. Obviously, it's in terrible condition. But you see the, the, the image that he's painting, it's, that's a straight Byzantine icon. It's called the Holy Gatria, she who points the way. And he is a little bit, if you just see more of him, he's a little bit more created by light and form rather than the flat modeling of the Madonna. I think people are over-exaggerate that to a certain extent because they want to show him kind of moving away in perhaps in a slightly uh, different direction. I don't know if there have been that many paintings by Italians on Crete, but there were certainly prints after the work. I'll show you one of them in just a little while. So that, for some reason, the, the, this was another one in the Bernacchi. They're always on loan when I'm there, but anyway, so I haven't actually seen the real thing. Now this is, Apparently this is signed, but I have problems with this one, I have to admit. It's in Modena, in Italy, northern Italy. Uh, they found it in the basement, in storage. And, and then, again, people thought, well, I'm going to do it by El Greco, wishful thinking. Um, and it's painted, it's, it's a triptych with folding wings. Normally the wings fold over to the halfway point. These ones go the whole way. But it's, it's painted on the front, it's painted on the back. <coughs> That's the back. And uh, to me, it looks like it's almost by a different artist anyway, because you've got the adoration of the shepherds and the baptism, which are very conventional in a sort of an Italian way. Again, not terribly good, to be honest. Uh, in the center part, that's something called the, an allegory of the Christian knight who's getting a nice pat on the head from the resurrected Christ. I think it would take the rest of our hour to explain that, so I won't bother. Uh, and then on the back, again, the Annunciation, Adam and Eve, very conventional, very conservative, very ordinary, and then this very weird um, image of, this is Mount Sinai in the Holy Land with the monastery of St. Catherine, and that's the famous, famous, almost the center of Christendom at that time, and there was also a monastery of St. Catherine on Crete, and that's where actually the main, the most important school of painting, of icon painting was on the island, so El Greco may, may well have been connected with uh, that. So, I mean, they're, they're okay, but they're not, not to be that great. Um, then this sort of thing, this is in the Onassis Foundation. 
And I think Mr. Nash has gotten taken for a ride here because I, I can't see anything El Greco-ish. Uh, it's a lot of, again, just sort of wishful thinking with these attributes. If it's in El Greco, it's worth millions of euros. If it's not El Greco, it's worth dozens of euros. So obviously there's a financial interest in who did that what. Uh, so that, I'm not too sorry about that, the Pieta. Uh, average of the major, and this actually looks fairly nice in a very conventional way. And again, it's sort of midway thing. You look at the architecture, that's very Italianate. You know, good, nice classical architecture, fairly solid figures, sort of strutting poses. It's, it's sort of all right, it's okay. Um, but then, is that, is that, are they by the same artist? This one's in Mexico City, for heaven's sake. How did they decide that was by Old Greco? Um, much lighter and brighter. Again, I think if he did it, he had to have done it in Italy, because the one thing you obviously don't get from prints is the color, and this is much more uh, Italian types of colors. And again, it, and I love the camels. And they, nobody had ever seen a camel, but sort of a word of mouth, the, a thing with a long neck and a funny, funny face. Um, and then, then I mean, and last time, so I'm, you know, the Ju Judas on this side, separated from the others, sort of floating figures. It's just, again, it's not that exciting. It's not in Bologna. Uh, last one, the, the Tombment, which I've never been to, the Alexandra Soup Sauce Museum in Athens. Have we all been there? I've never even heard of it. So we've got to go, we'll put it on the bucket list. Uh, anyway, this is another one. And this one, they can sort of, it's, it's the Entombment of Christ. These are the three Marys. We'll meet up with them in another one. Mm -hmm. And people have connected this to, there's a print after a painting book called by by Parmigianino, who was one of the great mannerist painters in, uh, in Italy, in northern Italy. And uh, the little similarities, particularly in, in the Marys, the three, Mary, three women. But again, you know, if you're just copying from black and white prints, uh, the color you need to get from uh, somewhere else. So none of these, uh, my eye, have a whole lot in common, or a lot of them, they're just, again, that idea of uh, wishful thinking. Uh, to make the attributions uh, correct. So to get good, to develop his own style, his unique style, he has to get to uh, Venice. So that's where we go uh, next. Now in Venice, he's only there for about three and a half years. Leaves in November of 1570. Then he goes down to Rome, for actually for a bit longer. He's there for about um, six or seven years. And well, he's 26 when he gets to Italy. And don't forget, there's no Italy at this point, we just keep saying that. But anyway, Tony said that's too old to really get started in some ways. And anyway, he said, this is a wonderful picture of Dionysus and uh, Ariadne uh, by the great Titian, the most wonderful of all the Venetian painters. And it's almost said that he actually studied with Titian. Titian is in his 80s, I'm sure he's not taking apprentices. El Greco's too old to be an apprentice, and he might have worked as an assistant, but even if he didn't, he had to have been influenced by the work of Titian, because everybody else was. I mean, he was king of the world in, in uh, Venice at this time. And something <coughs> like the energy, uh, the dramatic action, things like that, that's something that uh, would rub off on him. But I think the artist who influenced him most in Venice was the other great Venetian master, Tintoretto. This is his extraordinary, this is quite late, this is after when Al Greco was long gone. Uh, but it's in San Giorgio Maggiore, that Muslim little church on the island that you can see from the Doge's palace. Uh, again, all to do with spirituality, magical lighting effects, things like that. It's a huge picture, um, bigger than life, uh, an amazing piece of work. And again, a perspective that shoots you back into, you know, sucks you into the depths of uh, the picture. So a much earlier Tintoretto, a much more simple one, uh, around 1548, so again, this is done before uh, El Greco gets there. The, the woman taken in adultery, and the this is the story quite familiar, that this woman here, the adulteress, she's going to get stoned to death uh, for her terrible crimes, and then Christ comes along, and he actually writes in the ground there, and he says, let you who are without sin cast the first stone. And everybody in the crowd goes, oops, and that, you know, she is saved. Uh, so again, this idea of, I mean, this very common, sort of a building as that, this complicated architect, again, it just sucks you back into the picture. It's all rather stagey and theatrical, uh, not as much as Tintoretto will get, but this, this is 
again, what, in, what El Greco starts to do uh, when he's in there, he learns very, very quickly. I think he's a young artist, willing to learn, uh, and, and obviously has the talent to look at his elders and his betters and get things uh, from them. So this is his uh, wonderful painting called The Purification of the Temple. It's still very, very small, only, well, 26 inches high, uh, still painted on wood. It's in Washington, the National Gallery, uh, around 1570. And this is a, it's a very violent theme, because this is Christ. The one time he really loses his temper, he's in the temple and he's driving out all of the money changers, the merchants, the prostitutes, all of those people who were defiling the house of uh, God. And in terms of contemporary events, you can compare this to the Catholic Church fighting get back against the evils of Protestantism uh, and you know, driving out heresy, uh, basically. Uh, Jerusalem, where they are, it looks suspiciously like modern Venice, doesn't it? A little bit. And again, that adds to the kind of relevance uh, of uh, the scene. Again, as I said, a young artist willing to learn um, compared to the pictures we've just been producing in Crete. Obviously, he's a very fast uh, learner. I think, to be honest, it's a little bit too clever for its own good. It's, it's very busy. I mean, what we now is all this stuff here, all these little steps and ledges and tiles and everything. But again, he's got that perspective that shoots you back into space. Uh, wonderful, very thinly painted, rather overly complex poses, more so than you actually need to tell uh, the story. Uh, and, and even the anatomy of the figures is a little bit uncertain, perhaps. Uh, and look, look how Christ, he twists and he turns. This is something clever called the figura. It's almost like you put a coil around his body. The figura serpentinata, said he in fluent Italian. And he actually gets that from this chapter here, who might be Parmenides, uh, from Raphael's. That's the Raphael's, he included that later, the portrait of Michelangelo, in having a bit of a moody fit. Uh, in the School of Art, which is the most extraordinary image. If you haven't been to the Vatican Museum and you haven't seen this, before you get to the Sistine Chapel, you go through all of these wonderful rooms by Raphael. And this is the great School of Athens, around 1510. And that keeps, you know, have to keep remembering, the Renaissance means the rebirth, the rebirth of Greek values, of Greek ideas, of Greek philosophy, religion, what have you. Well, not so much, well, yeah, religion too. So you've got, you've got um, Plato and Aristotle in the center, all the other figures are grouped around here. They're not quite all Athenians. The title isn't totally correct. And I, I, I just, it's an amazing picture. You want to put the hell kind of a building is this? Raphael, among other things, is also the architect of St. Peter's, which is growing up 50 meters away from the, the, the Vatican, the Pope's apartments. And he's in there every other day. At this point, it hasn't got a roof. The walls are growing up. So I think what I was thinking when he's looking at this, this is what he just come from supervising uh, over in the, in the building of, uh, of the grandeur of uh, St. Peter. Now, for some reason, I never quite got this. Tinder had repeated himself over and over and over again. And there are different versions of different pictures. There are four, at least, of this. And the next one, you see, I think this is in Minneapolis. It's quite, it's quite a bit bigger. It's about three feet high, a meter high almost. Um, painted on canvas for once. And he clarifies things a little bit. Uh, the figure of Christ stands out a little bit more. He's got rid of some of the kind of busy stuff going on there, but the most interesting thing is he adds in, down at the bottom right-hand corner, uh, four portraits. And just to give you them. And, and they're actually on a separate piece of canvas that's been glued on. There's no attempt whatsoever to make, make us think they're actually in the picture. Uh, they're just there. And that, that's Titian. That's Michelangelo. That's a chap called Giulio Clovio, and that's probably Raphael. People a little bit argue about it. Uh, yeah. So these are kind of the role models, the mentors, if you like, of El Greco while he's living uh, in, in Venice. Well, he's, he's almost in Rome. And no, I think he is in Rome already by this point. Um, so you know, this, is, this is a kind of tribute, if you like, to, uh, to them. And the four characters here, the one you probably haven't heard of is Giulio Clovio. But El Greco painted this portrait of him. This is the first major portrait he ever painted in his life. It's pretty damn good, I think, and of this fellow, who was actually, he was from Croatia, but he was the most important, the last, really, of the great manuscript uh, illuminators. And in fact, he's holding in his hand, and pointing to it, in case we didn't notice, uh, this wonderful thing called the Farnese Hours, a book of prayers 
uh, commissioned by Cardinal Alessandro Farnese, who was the grandson of the Pope. Pope's aunt, Pope's aunt, grandchildren, never mind. Um, and just to zoom in on, on a page there, because it's just so interesting that, again, this is Manrich's art with all of the wonderful contortions and distortions. Uh, you've got the adoration uh, or the enunciation for the shepherds, uh, who just happen to be nudists. You don't see naked shepherds that often. <coughs> there they are. Then on this side, this is the Emperor Augustus with a nice sibyl coming along and showing him a vision of the, uh, the birth of Christ, the Madonna and child out there. And all these lovely naked ladies in between, which might be a little bit inappropriate for a holy book, but I think in a miniature, in a closed book, you can get away with it, uh, with that sort of thing. But he was an extraordinary, interesting, uh, useful uh, character. It was probably him who introduced El Greco to Cardinal uh, Alessandro, who was that chappy on the left here, in Titian's amazing portrait of the Pope Paul III, I and mean, he looks terrified at these awful grandchildren uh, coming at him. But he was the one who started at least the building of this grand palace in Rome, one of the grandest, the Palazzo Farnese, uh, one of the great, um, I don't know, well, see, I'll bring back, because through these introductions, he actually lived in this place for a while. I think that was his room up there. Well, no, not really, but it could have been. Um, in the palace, and again, it hasn't happened yet, at the very end of the century, even the Karachi comes along and creates really the first great monument of classical Baroque art. Classical Baroque kind of got rid of that, the evils and mannerism, because all those contortions, distortions, now you're getting back to more classical proportions, that sort of uh, idea. Uh, and the program here, it's all about the loves of the god. Omnia vincit amor. Even Zeus is brought low by the power of love. All these wonderful scenes. And the program for all of this was thought up by a man called the palace librarian, who was called Fulvio uh, Orsini. I found a print of him, not by El Greco. And at this time, librarians didn't just reshelve books. They were the scholars, they were the poets, they were the tutors of the family, children, this sort of idea. Uh, so another very, very important uh, connection to contact for uh, El Greco. And in fact, he was listed as the first owner of this portrait of his friend, uh, Giulio Clovio. And probably either, either one of those two could have introduced, you know, recommended El Greco to become a member of the Ac Academy of St. Luke, the painter's guild, if you like, uh, in Rome. But he was listed there as a painter of miniatures which don't, we don't really think of uh, El Greco as good. But it does, again, rub in the huge importance of having friends in high places. We'll find that uh, significant when he gets to Spain uh, as well. He, I know, he opened this one as well. Another version of that very weird uh, Mount Sinai. So a final comparison, a second comparison with Tintoretto, because this actually for a long time was attributed to Tintoretto, because it's so Tintoretto-esque, if that's a word, what it is now. Uh, Christ healing the blind, miracle, miracle going on there. Uh, other people not that interested, are they? They're just posing and pointing and just distracting us all. In some ways, the trouble with El Greco's works is that there is so much artistry and artifice that he sort of leads you away from the sheer meaning, the strict rule, if you like, of the painting. And the church wasn't that keen uh, to have distractions uh, very often. We'll see if it gets him into trouble in a while. But you might compare that, again, look at the perspective, whooshing to the background. Uh, Tinder added in a, a wonderful series of pictures uh, about the body of St. Mark, which was stolen by out of Alexandria, brought to Venice. You know, that's why his patron came to Venice. And again, you see this uh, perspective shooting back, uh, very, very thinly painted. Look, look at the uh, picture here, you can actually see, you know, you can see one is painted on top of the other. He put the floor down and then he painted the figures and the paints have worn through a little bit. Um, anyway, and the other the, the weird thing apart from all the distractions is the, um, the very odd couple in the foreground. Now they must be the people who paid for the picture. <coughs> if you pay, you get to be in. Uh, the donors. And because again, there are other versions of it where they're not there as another one. So again, this is the same, he's learning quickly, I think he gets better and better and better as we're going along, but still I think, obviously, uh, when we think of our director, we're thinking of his uh, career in uh, Spain. Now, see, he's not getting that, even though he's a member of the Guild, he's not getting that many really good commissions 
in Rome. In fact, he even had a fight with Carlo and um, Alessandro Farnese, and, and basically they thought he was just a bloody foreigner. And just, and who needs him when there were plenty of their own artists who were very, very good? So off he goes to Spain, not perhaps the most logical choice. Uh, he gets there in 1577. So now he's 36 already, which is very late on uh, to be sort of starting a career. He's got 38 years to go, and there were all sorts of jobs to be had in this extraordinary place called the Escorial, uh, not that far, about 30 miles outside of Madrid. Uh, must have kept hundreds of craftsmen, artisans, uh, what have you, uh, busy there, and he could have ended up just decorating ceilings, what have you here. But Philip II, the king, didn't like his very unorthodox style. He much preferred Titian. In fact, this is a Titian that he owned. Uh, he had Titian, you know, Titian came and lived in Madrid for a while. And Philip, he, he shouldn't have liked this. It's much too sexy. The one of Danny, the uh, shower of gold, the you know, Perseus is going to be the end result of all of this, the happy ending, if you like. Uh, but anyway, there's sort of He's supposed to be the great Puritan, uh, but obviously he had slightly double standards. But his job essentially was to stamp out heresy wherever he could find it. And that was basically everywhere within the uh, Spanish Empire. And the, the strictest form of Roman Catholicism had to be put into play against the Protestant uh, revolt. <laughs> And the map shows the extent of his empire. All the, even the Spanish Netherlands up here, the great revolt against that is going to happen in the following century. Uh, and originally, Charles V, another extraordinary reported by Titian, um, he, ab he just couldn't take it anymore. I think he abdicated in 1555 and 1556. It took him a long time to do it all, but he owned so much stuff. He gives the empire to his brother. <coughs> he gets the other Roman Emperor. And Philip gets everything else. <laughs> you get Spain, the Netherlands, the whole southern part of Italy, you forget that. That was all Spanish for a long time, Sardinia, and all, all, all the New World territories, which were bringing in huge amounts of money, uh, particularly gold, pouring into Spain, mostly through Cadiz, uh, down at the bottom there. So this is a very, very complex uh, situation. Uh, and again, he was a ruthless character, um, totally the sort of we find the most important agent of the Counter-Reformation uh, in, uh, in Europe. And don't forget, see, the, the Protestants are destroying religious art as fast as they can. The Catholic Church, and it was touch and go, because, you know, the second commandment, that shall not worship graven images. The Catholic Church decided that we want art, we want religious art, in fact, we want it to be exciting, dramatic, no longer kind of high rent supremacist, well-behaved stuff like Raphael. We want to get people fired up. Uh, it, in fact, it was called the, uh, the, the, the art to be an emotional stimulus to piety. You would never accuse Raphael of being uh, emotional. So, Agrippa was catering to this new demand, but I just wonder if the church knew exactly what they were going to get into uh, with his uh, works. Uh, this is Toledo down here, about 70 kilometers <coughs> south of Rome. Uh, it had been the capital of, of Spain for a bit. Um, Famous for its tolerance, Jews, Muslims, they all, everybody's got along just fine until the Jews were thrown out in 1492, the Muslims in 1502. This prosperity here came to an end in 1561 when Philip II moved his capital from Toledo to uh, Madrid. Nowadays, of course, you go to Toledo because that's where Art Reco had lived and worked for more than half of his uh, life. And you see that photograph of the town. This is our graphic, a very, very personalized view of the city, the threatening skies, the sort of the tortured landscape. Uh, again, you can see how he wouldn't be popular with people who wanted art to behave itself. Because the cityscape was a lot like a portrait, and you had to show the place at its best. Uh, you had to factor it, but also be fairly factual and truthful. In fact, he has shuffled most of the big, important buildings. He's moved them around. He's even got the river in a different place. So he's, it's his, his own interpretation. This is always what Albrecht does. He never just follows the plot in a conventional way. He always rethinks it and thinks it through and creates El Greco at, at the end of it all. And that, again, that was not everybody was happy uh, with that. So it's not exactly an inviting image. I don't think the Toledo Tourist Board, even perhaps nowadays, would have big posters of this to get people to come 
to the city. But very often, we saw how when Venice was at the back of the purification of the temple, he will put Toledo in the back of his religious picture. Again, to make him a little bit more relevant, it's not just a history lesson, this is sort of still um, relevant uh, today. Uh, the crucifixion he does in 1610, uh, totally surreal, totally spiritually charged, the city almost like a kind of photographic ne negative in a sense. This is the moment of Christ's death when the darkness comes on the earth and the, the sky is rent with bolts of lightning essentially, very theatrical and dramatic uh, from that point of view. The body floating above uh, and in front of uh, the city. See, what the church really wanted was this kind of thing by the great Rubens, almost exactly at the same time, within a year or so of each other, these two pictures. Uh, Rubens paints this up in Antwerp. And this is, I mean, this is Jesus Christ superstar. I mean, he's just, he's dying on the cross, but he's dying, but he's, all he's taking 10 people to hoist him, hoist him up on it, because he's carrying the weight of our sins, all of this dramatic stuff. But look, he's just come from the gym, he's been working out, and all of this power of the, the, the energy of the spiritual, strength equals physical strength. And, and it's amazing that this is just one little tiny part of a huge altarpiece that's now in Antifa uh, Cathedral. And again, much more truthful in some ways, this sort of little skinny Jewish guy up on the cross. That's not really what the church wanted to promote, their ideal of uh, Christianity. And again, this sort of thing makes the Vatican more relevant, perhaps. He also uses the city of now, Toledo is standing in for Troy. I think this is his only mythological work. He did three versions of this, but only this is the only one that so, has, has survived. It's in Washington. And this is the uh, Laoka one. Uh, it was actually a legend. I don't think anyone can believe at this point that <coughs> Toledo had been founded by a couple of Trojans, you know, who escaped after the war and uh, traveled to the West. Uh, it didn't really matter if it's true or not, but it's just it, um, it, it sort of connects against the city to uh, ancient history. But there's, there's, a, there's no excuse, if you like, for, to, for our brethren to portray this in such an anti-classical way. I mean, you just didn't do all of this lolling around. It's just inappropriate somewhere. The Trojan horse is one of the worst living Trojan horses ever. I'm guessing that's it. Uh, and then, again, they're supposed to look like this. That wonderful, by three artists from Rome, sculptors, uh, that was discovered in Rome in, well, the very early 16th century, had a huge impact uh, on Western artists. Uh, but again, you, know, the, you, you, you die, you suffer, but you still look bloody marvelous doing it. Uh, and again, that was, except if you like, the role model of Rubens when he portrayed his figure of Christ. And I'm sure you all know the story. This is that he was one of the, I think, 50 sons of Priam, the king. And he was the one who warned, he was, he was a priest, he warned the, his fellow citizens about the big old horse at the back door, beware of Greek bearing gift, he gets to say that in the movie. And a fanatic is punished, different versions of all these stories, by either Athena or Apollo, sending serpents to kill him and his two sons. Uh, so it's either that or, or he was caught having sex in the temple, which apparently you're not supposed to do. So pick your own version of why he's being punished. But still, so long as you look good, uh, while it's happening, that's all right. And again, that's that's Rubens, and that's El Greco. So he sort of, if you like, almost destroys the story. He makes it that way, but again, it's a very personal reinterpretation uh, of it. Now, I can never quite understand this, but very, very soon after he arrives in Toledo, again, he's a foreigner, he's got no credentials, really. This is the summer of 1577 gets an incredibly important commission from a man called Diego de Castilla, who was dean of the cathedral in Toledo. And he was the father of a friend that Albrecht had known in Rome. So again, this, and the idea of having connections uh, so important. There must have been dozens of good Toledo painters who would have loved to have got this job, and Toledo, uh, Albrecht gets it instead. But this is in the sacristy sort of like the, the, the locker room, the changing room, like of the priest. And it's a good subject for that, because this is the disrobing of Christ. Um, nearly three meters high, very grand, and what it shows is the moment just before the crucifixion, well, just before the crucifixion, Christ is stripped of his clothes, 
uh, mocked by the crowds that press in around him. It's almost a caricature, fake the good and evil, if you like. It's brought out here, very claustrophobic, pressing in uh, on him. So this is the road. I hope you all saw the movie. Uh, 1953, I looked it up. Richard Byrne, Gene Simmons, and Victor Mature. But it, because this is, you know, the crucifixion, the soldiers, they're all, you know, casting, you know, they're betting on who get to, uh, to keep it. So it's, 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 it's a clever picture in some ways. It's very flat, there's no real space, all those perspective things, they've all gone. <coughs> but look how there's a chappy down there who's leaning forward, he's drilling holes into the wood, to, you know, for the crucifixion. But look at Christ there, he just raises one hand above him, as if in blessing, as if forgiving him, and then this very kind of beatific expression uh, on his face. Or, and, and one, I mean, when you see in reproductive, you never really talk about pain, but look how the, the, the armor reflects the colors of the robe uh, and picks up there. I mean, he, he likes to, it's almost impressionistic when he one color affects others. Uh, there's nothing mm -hmm. sort of in isolation like that. And he has to be a portrait because look, look how different he is from all of the other characters that you see around here. Now, one of the things that bothered people was down in the bottom left-hand side, these are the three Marys that we just met. Now, one of the, they, they, they mostly show up in the, the, uh, you know, during the entombment of Christ. And one of them was Mary Magdalene. The other two, there's a lot of discussion about who exactly they were. It wasn't Mary, mother of Christ, wasn't one of them. It uh, doesn't really matter, but anyway, there they are there, and because of they're there, the Greco was called up in front of the, uh, the Spanish Inquisition, again, enforcing the new morality of the Counter-Reformation. Not only should they not be there, but it was inappropriate, it was thought, to have ladies present when a man was being stripped of his clothing. And they also didn't like the fact that Christ is shown a bit lower, he should be the top figure, not people um, clustering around uh, above him. And the cathedral wasn't all that keen either. They refused to pay him the full amount that they had agreed on. He's always having lawsuits with his uh, client, old El Greco. Uh, so, to avoid imprisonment, or worse, at the hand of the Spanish Inquisition, uh, he said, well, I'll, I'll take, I'll paint the mask, don't worry. Uh, but he never did, and they, wouldn't, they just had better things to do. They didn't follow up on their threats. Uh, and again, there are other versions of that. I think there's a I think, I think there are about 20 versions of this. I can't quite understand why it would be so popular. Some of he would have done himself uh, on commission, presumably from other people. Others sort of churned out by his uh, studio. He had a thriving studio in uh, Toledo. Beyond that, now he's got this plum job here. Now he gets an even bigger job in the church of San Domingo, El Antiguo. Uh, it's a brand new church at this time. That's, he ends up being buried here. And he signs up for the job here just within a month of finishing the disrobing that I just showed you. And this is all him, uh, the huge complex stuff here on the side, I think on the side walls of the, uh, the, the church as well. And most of what we see nowadays in the church are copies, because the originals have all been moved out, sold off, whatever you do with these things. Uh, and, and the top part there, that's the, the Holy Trinity, which is now in the Prado in uh, Madrid. And again, very, very clearly, Mannerist influences the twisted, dark, dead body of Christ supported. I mean, it's the hardest thing, I think, for any artist to illustrate. It's all about you know, the spirit. Um, you know, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. So you have the Son, the Father, the, the Dove is always the Holy Ghost. And these angelic characters here propping everybody up, I'm sure singing songs while they're at it. And again, it gets, it's, it gets, it's all about the mystery of this particular content. I would feel a little bit sorry for uh, the little cherubs who have to prod yes. everybody out here. Because they always, if artists have a little, even a little bit of a sense of humor, they're all sort of grunting and groaning and straining. But they, they think they look quite happy down there. Anyway, that's, that's the, the trinity. The major thing there, though, is this extraordinary image of um, the assumption of the Virgin Mary, just a bit related to the Dormition that we saw, but this is now actually her sort of zooming out to heaven. 1577 does, does this 13 feet high, which is big, and again, it's very visionary, it's very otherworldly. Uh, you might get, he's a philosopher, he studies, particularly in Rome, he studied Greek philosophy, 
So he knew about Plato, he knew about the return of our Dio, which is the return to God. You know, everything comes from heaven into earth, and then desires, Desio, desires to return back to heaven. So this is her uh, getting her heavenly uh, reward. So she exits the tomb with this very odd perspective, and, and it's almost like, well, there's, a, there's a two sources to this. One is the <coughs> apocryphal uh, account of St. James. The apocryphal just means, didn't get into the official Bible. But there he is with his book. He described describe this. Also, John the Evangelist in the book of Revelation uh, talks about the woman clothed in the sun. So she's always radiant light behind her and standing on the moon, which is why it looks like she's sort of skateboarding her way up to heaven. On the, so again, it's hardly conventional. You have these clashing colors, um, the odd perspective of the two, uh, jagged edges everywhere, rather a dangerous image in some of the disciples looking at each other with expressions of amazement and uh, confusion. I mean, the figures just seem to be bursting with uh, that sort of spiritual energy. It's good emotional stuff, again, exactly what the kind of Reformation wanted, however unconventional. El Greco's images. Uh, I think it's useful though to compare this to sort of the assumption of the Virgin, which is by Titian in the time of the Ferrari in Venice, right just before 1520. So he would have known this. This was when he was in Venice. This was one of the you know, prime works of art in a church in the city. Uh, and so again, he couldn't have not been influenced to a certain extent by it. But this is this is around 1520, just at the start of the. Uh, the official uh, Protestant Reformation. It's huge, it's double the height of the El Greco. Uh, absolutely dominates the church of the Frari. You see, you walk down this wonderful Gothic building here, and then through the, the screen, you see the altarpiece at the far end uh, of the church. Uh, and it's all again involved that promotion, shooting us up to heaven. We're all, that's the message in the church, good Christian propaganda, that if we behave ourselves and give generously to the church, then pretty well we're guaranteed uh, for our perpetual uh, reward. And again, as I said earlier with El Greco, you're always very conscious that uh, we're looking at art with a capital A. And that does distract a little bit, I think, somehow from the religious significance. With, with um, Titian, you don't really go, oh, isn't that clever, look how he's done that. Although, I mean, he is. You know, all the Delacroix and the Imprint, they all look mad to Titian because he does things that are just so wonderful. You can't really explain on a little image on the screen, but he's a very, very, very clever artist. But with that, with our record, it's all about the artistry. Um, and again, there's that sort of tension in his work. The mannerism that he's emulating is very often called the mannerist crisis. Again, the, the, the problems, the divisions within Europe, the religious conflicts of uh, the 16th century. Now, a little sort of private footnote about this one. If you've seen, we saw, I took this shot in Chicago, the Art Institute, across this great central area, and there's the picture. It was for a long time, it was the star of their whole collection, because El Greco was, was big. And then I took this shot later on from another angle, uh, and it just to show that uh, that's over the star nowadays is Kai Bach's wonderful picture of the, it's called Rainy Day in Paris, that was terribly unpopular when it was painted. But anyway, now it's, it's big time. Not to go on and on about this, but I could. Uh, yeah, this is, shows how ridiculous the word impressionism is, because yeah, there's nothing impressionistic. They have dozens of drawings, that, even the cobbles with water. People complain that they've got their umbrellas up, but it's not actually raining, because they were so, you know, pedantic, if you like, about that sort of realistic view of it. Anyway, I thought, I thought this was rather clever, because I'm shooting over that, and it was only later I noticed the ghost of El Greco, the ex heroine of, of the uh, museum reflected in the glass looking across. Okay, this is the one, this is where we came in with the, uh, the vision of St. John. It's called the opening of the fifth seal. It's quite, it's actually just a bit uh, of, a, of a much larger conglomeration of pictures. There were three large altarpieces they did for the, the hospital of St. John the Evangelist just outside the walls of Toledo and they've all been split up and they've uh, dispersed. Uh, 1608 to 14, he did it, about seven and a half feet high, a couple of meters high, uh, in the Metropolitan uh, Museum. This was actually left unfinished when he died in uh, 1614. And it illustrates, not 
not sure if that's quite the right word. But there are some verses from, again, the book of Revelation that I just mentioned, John the Evangelist's vision on the island of Patmos, uh, where the seven seals are opened. Um, the book that essentially prophesies the end of uh, the world. And of course, it's all open to all, all sorts of different uh, interpretations. The first four seal, seals, when they're open, they reveal the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Very famous stuff. The fifth seal uh, refers to the Christian martyrs. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were killed for the word of God, abbreviating a little bit, and they cried with a loud voice, and white robes were given to every one of them. Um, again, they're not getting white robes, they're getting nice colorful ones, because that's better for art, you see, I suppose. Uh, so he doesn't slavishly copy the text. But again, all of the color, the light, the movement, they're all combining to create this appropriately visionary, apocalyptic uh, quality. And I think here you have to sort of see sideways to the, the prevailing religious thought process, if that's the right word. Uh, St. Ignatius of Rizola, who was the founder of the Jesuits, he wrote the spiritual exercises, which again stressed the immediacy of religious uh, experience. And I think maybe the best way to illustrate that is by Nini's extraordinary, his Bernini was theater of everything rolled into one. Um, and the, the ecstasy of St. Teresa in, in Rome. And Saint, this is St. Teresa of Bavilla. She was a nice Spanish lady, but had these wonderful visions. And one of them is a very, very sexy one, where this angel comes along with a spear of divine love and thrusts it into her several times, and she's moaning with delight and joy. It's really, I mean, I call it a spiritual orgasm. There's no other way of putting it. So to illustrate that and not be rude, that, I think, shows a lot of uh, Bernini's genius, because it's just here, St. Teresa, floating on the cloud. But again, it gets you excited about this particular religious, the immediacy of that religious uh, experience. So just to calm you down a little bit, after all this religiosity, a couple of portraits. He's an extraordinarily good portrait painter. Uh, and this one, is, it's in the Metropolitan Museum of New York. It's, it's called a cardinal, and I'm not sure, it's all sort of argument about who it is. It might probably be Don Fernando Nino de Guevara, who just happened to be the Grand Inquisitor. So I think, you know, this could be El Greco's revenge, in fact, because he's a very spooky character. Uh, for all of the problems that the, um, the Spanish Inquisition had caused uh, El Greco in his earlier year. But it's a it's sort, of a sort of magisterial portrait, enthroned, kiss my ring, all of this sort of stuff. But look at that, that expression on the face. I mean, he's very good at, I think, of just getting away with it. Because, you know, I mean, the fellow isn't going to be totally offended by this, but I think El Greco is telling us an awful lot about this character. And I think the model for that, even the sort of clutch pen, the model for that is. Uh, Raphael's wonderful portrait of Pope Julius II, <coughs> the one who built St. Peter's, the Raphael rooms, the Sistine Chapel ceiling, all of that, and this great patron of the arts, as well as the warrior Pope, right in the battle at the head of his troops. I'd love to see some of the present day ones doing that. I mean, war would be finished in no time at all if they had to, to do that. So, anyway, look at I've actually reversed this. It goes in the other direction. It's in London in the National Gallery. But that's, I think, where the idea comes from. Uh, again, after this, every ruler, every chairman of the board, they all wanted to be portrayed in this kind of, uh, of way. And, and then the other one, just to show you one more, and this is my, in my top five portraits of all time anywhere, uh, a fellow called Fray Hortensio Felix Paravacino, painted in 1609, so fairly late on his career, in Boston, the Museum of Fine Arts. And before our writer was popular in America, because it took a while to catch on, the picture was bought by the museum in 1904 on the recommendation of John Singer Sargent, who I was lecturing about here a little while ago. He was a huge admirer of Spanish art. Spanish art was becoming popular, but most people like Velasquez and Maurice or people like that. They hadn't gone around to El Greco yet. So Sargent, who was in Boston a lot of this time, talked them into uh, to buying it. And you can see why when you see the, uh, the, the quality of And again, if you can zoom in a little bit, uh, just how he sort of paints white on white and the Everything sort of almost disappears when you move in. And he was actually, well, he was a great intensive Provencino, an Italian family, uh, but born in Madrid. He's, he's a Trinitarian friar. Not sure exactly what that is, but it doesn't matter. He's only 29 years old, already famous as a scholar and a poet. 
actually wrote it publicly about El Greco. Uh, he was professor of rhetoric at Salamanca University when he was only 21. Uh, and uh, the thing is, when you go to Boston, they may have moved it now, but I took that shot. See, it's right there in this huge hole, totally lost in all these incredibly noisy pictures all the way around it. And what this picture like that needs is a separate room all to itself, a nice comfortable sofa to sit on, some mellow music in the background, and a nice glass of wine. That would be good. And then you can just really, really spend time with it. Because, you know, I've said this in other lectures, sometimes I mean, they, they follow people in museums. The average viewing time is 3.4 seconds per picture. Yeah, so you just, you don't actually see, oh, well, I saw a lovely remember. Well, no, actually you didn't. And, and you know, you, to see something like this, to, to admire and enjoy, you've really got to allow it to be sort of seduced by El, El Greco's huge talents. Look at that expression on the face. I mean, compared to that, uh, the Cardinal, well, this is just so affectionate and lovely. Um, and again, it rubs in the fact you can do proper proportions when he wants to. The other ones are just to... Um, again, I think he gets that from Greece. Um, you know, the, the elongation of figures, the denial of, of sort of classical proportions, because he's showing a world not of this, this our recognizable world, but something more, a world of the spirit. So I'll finish this off with this, probably, well, I don't know if it's his greatest one, certainly it's his most famous one. Again, this is the highlight of Ellery's visit to Toledo, uh, called The Burial of Count Orgach. So we've gone back a little bit in time, 1586 to 88, um, nearly five meters high in the church of Santo uh, Tomé. In fact, it's in a rather gloomy side chapel. No photography allowed. I took this very illegal shot. You go, you're split up into groups, and you go in three at a time, one at the front, one in the middle, one at the back, and you slowly shuffle forward. People start shouting the group at the front to move on. And so gradually you, you sort of get up close uh, to this extraordinary thing. And it's showing the burial of this fellow who wasn't exactly, uh, his name was Don Gonzalo Ruiz of Toledo. He wasn't a count, but he, was, he had lands including the nearby village of Orgas. So he was given a sort of an honorary title, but he was a very pious man. Uh, he paid for the restoration of this church of Santa Tomé. He also then made arrangements for the villagers to make to keep making payments for the upkeep of this church in perpetuity, forever. And he was rewarded by this nice funeral, and the spiritual bonus being that the venerable Saint Augustine and the youthful uh, Saint Stephen showed up to help lower him into uh, his tomb. All this happened in the very, very early 14th century. So a couple of hundred years later, the villagers had rather conveniently forgotten that they were supposed to be paying money into the church. So this picture was then commissioned to remind them of their obligations, of their responsibility. And El Greco was paid 1,200 ducats for it. I have no idea how much that is. He's actually asked for 1,600 and didn't get it. So he even wrote to the Pope trying to get the full price out of him. But he also got, isn't it? He got, he got two sheep, <coughs> two sheep, 16 hens, two goats, skins of wine, and two cords of wood. So he must have had a very good agent. So what this, this actually is being compared to the Dormition. I, I think people that like to really connect El Greco permanently back to his roots on, on Crete as the icon painter. Uh, and, and it's just the idea, again, of the earthly, the heavenly. But you could have said the same thing for the, um, for the Virgin Mary shooting up to heaven, uh, the one we saw a, little bit, a few minutes ago. So I, I, I think that's pushing your luck a bit to see a connection there. Uh, but it is an extraordinary painting. Everybody liked the bottom part because they saw themselves. That's the actual people in modern dress, obviously, uh, witnessing uh, miraculously this uh, particular fruit. So it's all friends who were like, oh, look, there's old so and so. When it was painted, they would have done it, at least. But they weren't quite so sure about the upper zone, uh, the heavenly part, where an angel carries the soul of the count up into the heavenly uh, sphere. It's rather a disquieting vision of where we're all headed, we go. And El Greco's reputation declined. I, mean, I think people were a little bit embarrassed by all this excessive uh, piety. In the late 19th century, the canvas was described as hanging like a rag. It was dismissed as the work of a magnum. I should also have had a couple of quotes about um, the, the meaning of the work. Somebody called it... Come on, notes, where are you? Um, a rather vulgar and morally pointless 
miracle, or El Greco's most genuinely mystical masterpiece. So take your pick. It's up to you to decide which you think it is. Anyway, that's the, the whole thing. And, and again, what we see, is I found this shot, it was, uh, I, think, I, I think this is during the Spanish Civil War, where it doesn't look like in good shape at all, but we're having sandbags piled up around it. But first, again, if we just go to the lower area, the actual burial, uh, we see the count here looking a little bit off color, as one would expect. Uh, and again, the good solids in all in uh, contemporary dress, including El Greco, who's that one there, with his hand conveniently sort of going point, point. Uh, here he is. Mm -hmm. uh, over on this side, totally missing the whole thing. He's reading a book. It's Andres Nunez, who was the Paris priest. And he's actually the one who, he was a friend of El Greco. Uh, he commissioned uh, the painting. And then, I mean, the, but just how you paint it, again, without any distortions, really. Uh, the vestments of the two saints, St. Saint Augustine, all this wonderful chasuble, what have you. Uh, this lovely arm, again, picking things up. Uh, St. Um, St. Stephen, we know it's him because that's down there, it was on his road, that's, he was the first Christian one, he was stoned to death, and that's what's going on there. And it, it, look, at, look at this guy's um, vestments here. I mean, you can see why John Cassandra just go nuts over this. Nobody painted like this, ever, until he came along. Just shimmering uh, an extraordinary way. Over here, well, that, that's a, there's a, an, an Augustinian explaining the miracle to a Franciscan, you know, oh, don't, don't <coughs> you can see the hand gesture there. So there's obviously there's a lot of personal animosity between the, these various monastic orders, perhaps. Uh, the little boy, always identified as El Greco's son, Jorge Manuel, and in fact his signature, he's got a hanky sticking out of his pocket, and he signs it there, again, Domenico Spion and the date 1578, which isn't the date of the painting, it's the date that uh, Jorge Manuel was uh, born. And you get the upper area, that's the one that was just difficult for people. Um, what you actually have in the middle, though, is you've got Christ uh, with flanked by Mary, his mother, and John the Baptist. Now, that is straight visibly. That's the deities. And you see that everywhere. The most, most wonderful example, for example, in uh, Hagia Sophia in, in Istanbul. And anyway, so that's, again, part of his heritage. Right? There's old St. Peter with the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, on this side, all the other saints lined up, uh, including St. Paul. Philip II is apparently in here, although he's not dead yet. He shouldn't be up in heaven, but I can't quite figure out which one he is. Doesn't matter. And then, anyway, as I said, this business of hauling the soul up to heaven, a little bit, uh, again, of a sort of rather strange uh, idea. The, his mother was uh, a, a nice lady called Doña Geronima de las Cuevas, who was a Spanish, she was sort of aristocratic, uh, and for some reason they never got married, probably because she didn't want to marry anything as awful and common as uh, a mere painter, uh, you know, an artist and somebody who gets their hands dirty. Uh, he did well, though, in Toledo. He rented a 24-room apartment in a Gothic palace He'd hire musicians to play tasteful dinner music. Uh, he didn't actually always pay them, so that ended up with a few more lawsuits. And he died actually in debt, with most of the 24 rooms empty of furniture. So I'm going to let another Greek, Nikos Katanzakis, have the last word. Art, he says, is not submission and rules, but a demon which smashes the molds. In other words, don't let other people tell you what to do, just go crazy. And I think El Greco is perhaps the best example of, of that. I'm glad that our taste has been liberated enough that we can appreciate what he was up to. But you have to go to Toledo, and that's really where you see him at his best, on his own turf. Anyway, thanks a lot. No, I couldn't find any pictures by El Greco of dogs, which I was going to end up just to remind you what you're supposed to be giving generously uh, to the strays. Uh, but do it anyway. Um, Next, I, I think some of you are going down to Hedra this week. I'm going to do the dog lecture down there again. Also, my thefts lecture. I think it's great. I'm really enjoying that one. Great works of art that you them. Uh, I'm going to do that fairly soon here. As soon as Dennis, Dennis suggested things like that, as soon as they get back, I'll do a few more. Anyway, thanks all for coming out. I thought we were only, only going to have three people, so <laughs> it ended up being quite good. Okay, thank you very much.